um, share some information about the four the plan for the four building projects. Um, walk you through sort of how we're performing outreach related to those projects. Um, we'll we'll look at the tool briefly, and then if people have any questions on any of that, um, it's really mostly meant to get hear feedback from um, the residents and anybody who has questions on it. So um, the one thing I'll say before we before I share my screen and we look at a few things is the financial option that we presented uh, to the finance committee last week, it was really meant to be the beginning of a process. It's not, it was not a final product by any means. It was meant to be responsive to one of the goals set out um, by the town council this year, which was to bring forward a plan for the four building projects. And then, you know, our hope was to share that out hold some sessions like um, the one we're holding uh, this afternoon. And, and there's another one coming up on March 6th. Um, hear feedback from residents and, and counselors and then refine that plan going forward. So um, I'll, I won't spend too much time actually going over the plan. Uh, the, we'll, I'll show you where the presentation is posted and we're gonna be posting the video from the finance committee meeting as well. But um, I'm happy to clarify anything that anybody has questions on and, and we'll go from there. So I'm gonna share my screen. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um, all right, done, done. All right. Bear with me one second while I share my screen. All right, so the, the thing I wanted to start with is the to talk a little bit about the new engagement tool that the town has been using. Um, our communications manager, Brianna, has put a lot of work into this, and it's this is the first time I've worked with it related to this project, but from what I've seen so far, it's really neat, and it's it seems like it's going to be a really good method for getting two-way communication on different things. So the web address is at the top, engageamherst.org. This is the landing page that you'll see when you first go to Engage Amherst. And there's a lot of information here that you can um, read about. I'll point out a couple things. Right now we have four projects or four activities that are on the Engage Amherst website. Uh, but as more things come up in the future, we, we talked about maybe doing like the FY22 budget possibly on here and some other activities that come up, there will be more added and you'll see how the, find the four building project one works. Um, there's lots of neat ways to interact and share your feedback and again, get two-way communication, answers to questions and things of that nature. Um, so we'll be focusing tonight on the financing the future one, which is related to the four building projects. Um, before I go into that, I will say, if anybody is interested in this Engage Amherst um, tool, there's a feedback form where you can say whether you like it, don't like it, or if you have any requests for things that maybe aren't there currently that you'd want to see added. And there's also this um, learn more, which I'm going to click on. If you go to learn more, there's some FAQs that might answer some questions anybody has. Um, and there's also a Q&A feature here and there's a, a poll here that you can um, interact with as well. So there's a lot of good information, a lot of credit to Brianna for putting this all together. She's been amazing at supporting sort of the outreach related to these projects. So I just want to acknowledge her work. So I'm going to go back. If you click on the Engage Amherst, that brings you back to the home page. And then if you click on the financing, the future and click learn more. So this is the project page for the four building projects that's dedicated specifically to the financing of those four projects. Um, there's a little introduction here that sort of explains, you know, why we're even talking about this. On the right hand side, it talks about who's listening. So right now it's myself and Brianna. So that means whenever somebody submits a question on this page, Brianna and I are notified of that question. And then that way we can um, respond to it. So the right now, the main feature on this page is this questions uh, tool. You can come in here and 
again, write a question, put your email and, and how you, your screen name, how you want it to appear. And then as soon as you sub submit that, the question will come to both Brianna and I, and the right person can answer the question. And when we answer it, you'll get an email. It'll, it'll post here so that we can have a running list of questions. So if there's recurring questions that come up, people can come here first and see if it's been asked. But it will also send an email to the person that asked the question to let them know it'll, it'll set, provide them the answer. So it's, it's a good way of sharing information directly with the person asking, but also keeping an inventory of the question so that we can develop a frequently asked questions document or just have a list, a running list for people who are interested. So that's the main um, feature that we're using right now, but there's lots of other things for other types of activities that can be done. And so you can see we have one question that was posted a few days ago asking where the tool is. At the time, the, the tool was not posted. It is now, so I'll show you where that link is. So the other thing on this right-hand side, you can subscribe to these project pages. So it allows us to send updates to anybody who subscribes. So when there's new information or changes to the page, we can update the group. Um, so that's one feature that is nice with this um, Engage Amherst tool. There are some links, again, specific to the four building projects. So we've got the public engagement tool, we've got background information, and we have, this is the finance committee presentation. So this, anyone who's interested in, in reviewing what was presented, um, the preliminary financial plan that was presented, I would say start with this. And we're actually gonna be clipping the video of that presentation so that you can get the, the, the words that went with it, essentially. And then below that are key dates of what's coming up. So some of these things have already happened. There was a cup of Joe on the, on the four building projects last Friday. The Jones Library gave a, uh, there was a presentation on the Jones Library project on Monday. We're here tonight doing the, the workshop. And there will be another one on March 6th at, um, I believe it's 9 a.m. Uh, for anybody who wants to come back and ask more questions. So I'm going to quickly, so if you click on um, the, the presentation, so again, this is the, I'm not gonna go through this tonight because we're gonna be posting the video and, um, and this presentation is here. But if anybody has questions on this, again, I'm happy to, to answer them. Or if we can't answer them tonight, we'll take, that, take it down and then get back to, to whoever's asking it. And then I will also click on the building tool. That's gonna open up. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can share the screen that has the Excel tool on it. Okay. So this is the, um, the public engagement tool. It's meant primarily to help the public, um, A, get involved and to understand some of the decisions and some of the variables that um, we're all thinking about as we develop these plans. It's, it's not capable of doing every scenario or uh, or doing the detailed planning, the nuanced stuff that we, you know, we have to get into the nitty gritty with. Um, but it does an okay job at kind of helping people understand relationships between different things. Um, so there's some instructions that anybody can review. It gives you a little breakdown of, um, you know, what to review first and some of the assumptions where the information came from. There's a glossary that just does some basic definitions. And then the simulation tab itself is right here and you know I'll do just a quick overview of this. You start with the first question um, and pick the options that you want to model. So this first one is the library. Um, you pick the option. So there's the addition renovation option, which is the MBLC project that's being considered. And we also listed a number of repair options. So there's different tiers of repairs. We recently updated the repair options to include the two new um, repair options that Kuhn Riddle put together. The only thing, again, that this, this isn't nuanced enough to really uh, uh, um, implement the timeline that Kuhn Riddle proposed. So if you click these options, it's just gonna be based on whatever year you say the debt is gonna start. It's not gonna follow the timeline that Kuhn Riddle put together. Then you pick the debt, the, the year that the debt would start. So just in general, that's usually once the project has started, um, and usually after it's a year in, um, you might start making debt payments on the project. And again, this is another thing that's more nuanced when we work with our financial advisor, we map out you know, when we're gonna borrow money, 
when's the first time we would have to start making payments on the money we borrowed. Then the next piece is the funding source. So whether it's gonna come out of our the existing money that we allocate towards capital, or if we're going to propose a debt exclusion, which means we would raise additional taxes, um, it would have to be a vote by the uh, council and uh, of the taxpayers. And if we would raise additional taxes to specifically fund the debt related to that project, and that would be a temporary increase in taxes um, for the life of the debt of whatever project is approved for a debt exclusion. And then the last piece is the borrowing term. So how many years do we wanna borrow over? So you got that for the library, similar options for the fire station, similar options for the public Department of Public Works. The schools get a little more nuanced because there's a couple different options. So there's, um, there's a single school option, which right now is the uh, 575 student enrollment option. And then there's a two school option, which I believe the enrollment is 320. Um, and so with, that means there'd be an MSBA project for an enrollment of 320, and then there would have to be something else to address the other school. And so if you, you can only do one or the other. So if you pick the single school option, then you can't adjust the other two. If you pick the two school option, then you can't adjust the single. So it's sort of an either or, you do one or the other. And for uh, both this project and the MBLC project, there's grant funds automatically applied um, for the schools. We assumed a 50% reimbursement rate, which is hopefully conservative. Um, and we'll get a more detailed, once we move farther along in the MSBA process, we'll get a, more, a better sense of what the reimbursement rate is gonna look like. So right now the options are 80 million with a debt starting in 2025, um, using a debt exclusion for the schools and paid back over 30 years. Once you answer those questions on what you want to model, then you can adjust some of the other assumptions that affect it. So the next one would be the borrowing rate or the interest rate. So we give a range of between two and 5%. Right now, um, rates are at the lower end of that. Rates are really good, as many of you have probably heard. So I'll put it at 2%, even though it's probably may not be realistic, but I'll just do it for illustration purposes. Um, next is choose the percentage of the tax levy that is allocated towards capital. So the way the town funds capital, um, the most majority of its capital is each year we decide what percentage of the tax levy will, will be allocated towards capital projects. And it, we were in 20, FY20, I believe we were around nine and a half percent. We were hoping to go to 10% for FY21, but then the pandemic hit. And capital is one of the areas we look to, to off, offset the impact of COVID-19 for that particular year. And so now we're trying to get back to where we were. So we were planning on going to 10% in FY21 before the pandemic hit. So I'll just make this 10%, again, for illustration purposes. This, this Again, this means allocating 10% of the tax levy for capital. And then the last question is, how much will be allocated towards other capital needs in town? So a lot of our focus is on the four building projects, but we don't want to lose sight of all the other capital needs because we don't want to create issues in other areas that we don't currently have issues. So we want to maintain a, a significant amount for uh, other capital needs while we're also addressing the, the building projects. And so right now we've got it at 4 million, which is pretty good. Um, as if you think about that's being used for everything outside of uh, the school, the two built two school buildings, the library, the DPW and the fire station, having 4 million for everything else is pretty good. So if you come down and once you make those uh, changes, this chart updates automatically and you can see how you're doing. So this solid black line reflects how much is allocated towards capital. So whatever your choice was there, whatever percentage you chose, this will move up or down. The green bars are existing debt that the town is already um, obligated to pay. The yellow bar is how much you have decided for other capital needs. So if you chose 4 million, this would adjust to 4 million. The one thing I'll note is the first few years here, 2022 through 2025, it's actually based on the five-year capital improvement program. So those years are fixed. And then the 4 million kicks in after, I think, I think it kicks in in 2026. And then if you chose uh, a debt exclusion, the project won't appear here because this chart shows the funds that are coming or the projects that are being paid from our existing capital. If you chose a debt exclusion, that would come from another source. So that doesn't show here. So you won't see the, the single school appear here. 
And what you will see are the other projects that were selected as coming from uh, existing capital. So the gray bar is the debt payment for the DPW. The purple bar is the debt payment for the library and the red bar is the debt payment for the fire station. And so you can see what that looks like over time. And so when the bars exceed the black line, that means in that particular year, the, the sum of our debt payments, um, both projected and actual, um, and the sum of our ongoing capital, the cost for our ongoing capital needs, it exceeds the, the resources that we have. And so that's not necessarily means it's impossible that we plan, uh, even going back several years when we were planning for these projects, it was assumed we would use some amount of reserves to uh, basically buffer the peaks. When we have a peak in uh, the debt payments, we would use our reserves during those years. So it's really a matter of how much do we exceed that black line and whether we feel our reserves are sufficient to cover those years. And so we built in this little box down here that tells you by how much do the yellow bars cumulatively exceed the black line. So in this particular case with these options, the yellow bars exceed the black line by 4.8 million. And we put some, so people have some context. Um, if it's if it doesn't exceed it at all, it would highlight green showing that the, the option is affordable. If it's between a zero um, and a $10 million deficit, we if it's marked as yellow saying it might be affordable, but we would have to think about what other sources of funding we would use to offset those years where the debt payments exceed the, the funds we have available for capital. And then if it's over 10 million, we mark it as red saying it's likely not affordable. So, you know, there's no hard and fast rule for those. We just try to give some uh, guardrails for people to consider when they're to, to give some context to the number that comes up here. A couple more things, I'll turn over for questions. So um, this chart just shows the outstanding debt from the new building project. So as the new, as we start paying the debt on those projects and those buildings are completed, you'll see the debt ramp up. And then as we make the payments, the debt starts to wind down. And then the last thing, this is to help people get a sense of what the impact may be from a debt exclusion. So based on your options above um, and the, the value of your home or the value of the home you wanna see the impact on, uh, this will adjust accordingly. So for example, if we wanted to change this to 250,000, then it, Depending on how the debt schedule is set up, the you know the early years the impact would be about two hundred dollar addition to the annual tax bill, um, and that would trickle down as the debt decreased over over the life of the debt obligation. Um, so when you're in here, you can put in any value you want to get to get that information. Just note that it is an estimate, and it's based on our the value of taxable properties in town right now, and that changes every year. So um, this really has to be updated every year. To, to get an accurate picture for that particular year. If the tax if the tax base grows, then the impact will lessen for each individual home. And with that, I was gonna stop sharing my screen for now. We've got some more people that have joined, that's great. And I'm gonna open it up for questions. So if anybody has any questions, um, just raise your hand and I will turn, make it so you can speak. Someone's gotta have questions. Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, if Sorry, no one else is able to speak, I might, I might as, well. as well. No, thank you. And Tony, I wanna let you know, I, do, I did get your question and I'll be um, responding to that hopefully early tomorrow. Great, thanks. thanks. I, just I just stumbled, stumbled across, across that, website that website by chance. chance. So it's, so good, it's to good to see you see advertising, advertising it tonight. tonight. So, so uh, thanks, uh, for, thanks this, for this, Sean. It's, it's amazing, amazing amount, amount of work, amount of work that, that, you've that you've done, done clearly. clearly. Um, um, I had a few had questions. A few questions. For, me, for me, the priority, the priority is the school, the school followed, followed by the fire station. And I'm worried about operating budgets. And the effect, and the effect that, that is, uh, that will that have, we'll on, have staffing, on staffing, both at the, both schools, at the schools and all other town, town departments. departments. So with, so those, with those priorities, priorities in, mind, in mind, for me, for me I'm, concerned I'm concerned that if the, that if the library, library happens, happens first, first out of capital, out of capital that, that, that that 
commits, commits at least, at least $16, 16 million dollars toward, toward that project, that project that, won't that won't be available, be available for other projects, for other projects later. later. If, if a school, a school override, override fails, fails presumably, presumably we want to keep, keep going with the with project, project regardless, regardless of, of we don't want to pull out just because the school override fails. So we're going to need $40 million in capital, or at least the ability to repay debt for $40 million out of capital. So I would consider, or am I right in thinking that, first of all? And then secondly, to me, then, the logical conclusion is that the library should be an override, and it should happen after the school's override, so that if the school's override were to go down, we can still afford to do the school project. Yeah, so let me um, give you my thoughts and then if you have any follow-ups. So one of the complicating factors is the library and the school are part of grant programs that have sort of specified timelines. So I'm unclear, I don't think it will be an option to wait until after the schools, when the school would come up for a vote to vote on the library. We have to think more through what those timelines look like. Because um, we're really in the early stages of the of the school process, um, we're going through the process right now as a school building committee to bring on an owner's project manager. So that's really the very sort of beginning stage of the feasibility study. So the so that's one thing that complicates all of this is thinking about the different timelines related to each grant. Um, the second piece, you know, if a debt exclusion fails for the school, I think we have to rethink all of this. So it you know, that would be a $40 million um, cost. Right now, that would be, you know, almost as much as the other three projects combined. So if that does fail, that's one of, you know, one of, one of the things you'll see in the presentation that was given at the Finance Committee. That's really one of the underlying assumptions that if that doesn't happen, then the whole plan has to be reconsidered. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I, I totally get your point about operating budgets, and it's um, a really good one. So we're in the process, and I'm sure this will come up more at finance committee when we talk about this, of modeling more of what the future could look like around operating budget. So I think in the presentation, we just focused on FY23, um, mainly because that was the year sort of the greatest jump in our capital spending. Um, however, you know what, what I've heard, one of the pieces of feedback I've heard so far um, from you and from others is can we model out farther um, under different assumptions and see what the impact may be on operating budgets past FY23. Um, so that's something I'm working on now that will, you know, when we refine the model and we, we come back with more information, I'm sure that will be part of it. Great. And I know for this year, it's, it's not just hitting in FY23. Right now, departments are putting together their budgets for the year that starts on July 1st, FY22. Mm -hmm. And the instruction to them, as you know, was 1.5% increase. And so far, we've seen that, that for the regional schools, that means a million dollars in cuts. And then last night at the Amherst School Committee meeting, we saw it's over half a million dollars in cuts. We haven't yet seen what it'll mean for the other departments, but presumably it'll be staffing cuts across the board for this year too. So that's FY22. FY23, possibly FY24, and maybe even FY25, when the operating budgets are going to be cuts, 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 cuts. And as Peter Demling said, once they're gone, they never come back. Mm -hmm. So when you lose a program, you lose a program for good, like the culinary program, or you know, you know from your time in the schools, things go away and they never come back. So I feel, um, you know, bearing in mind, if other people share my priorities, where school is number one, fire is number two. And, a, and I have a strong concern about the impact to operating budgets, I feel like there's got to be a way to postpone a decision on the library until after the school is more solid. And if that means going to the MBLC and saying we need two more years, you know, before we can commit to funding, then maybe that's the path to go. Because once we move forward on that, we're committed to spending that money. And, and you know, it's at least $16 million. The numbers I ran myself, it makes it look like it's another two and a half million beyond that at least, um, which I assume would fall to the town. So um, yeah, I just wanted to see if there, if there can be some exploration of that, you know, of postponing a decision on the library so that we can make sure the school is locked in first. And if not, like you say, everything falls apart because we need to be able to 
afford to repay $40 million in debt for the school, which I think, you know, it'd be interesting to know if the town was polled what people's priorities would be and if they would share those priorities that I have. I'm sure everyone has different priorities, but it would be good to know where people stand. And, and if the library is not number one, then maybe the library shouldn't go first. Thanks, Tony. I'll, I'll do a brief response and then I'll, um, I'm going to go to the next question. And then if you have other questions, feel free to raise your hand again. Um, the one thing I will um, just say is for this year, and it's, again, it's a good point Tony made, this year we are facing a, a one and a half percent budget increase. And a lot of that has been caused by the pandemic. And one of the key variables as we look forward and we're estimating the impact on operating budgets will be how quickly do we come out of the pandemic and do our revenues return to normal. Um, our local receipts took a huge hit during the pandemic when everything shut down. Um, and if we get back to normal and in a reasonable amount of time, that's going to make things a whole lot easier looking forward. If it's a slower recovery, then it'll be a, a different story that we'll have to um, model out. So that's a key variable, again, that we're looking at as we go forward is how quickly do we recover and do things get back to normal, um, relative normalcy uh, after the pan once we get out of the pandemic. So I will now turn it over to the next person, which is Kathy. Hi. Hi, Kathy, how are you? I'm good. Um, I'm, I decided to go on and watch you do the tutorial rather than try to go on myself. I have a question um, that you may know the answer to or not, but with a debt exclusion override, do we have to go out for the entire amount or can you go out for part of it? So if it, with the, and I know with your model, so I could say, suppose the school was 20 million out of current, out of our capital flow and another 20 million was coming from debt exclusion. I could play with it so I could see what those two impacts are, but do you know whether that's possible? So I think it is possible. You can't do it with the tool, because again, that's one of those things that's a little more nuanced, but I believe it is possible to um, exclude whatever amount um, you want, essentially, of, uh, of the debt. So we, I can, but I can verify that just to confirm. Okay, because it, it's a financing. So the kind of back and forth on saying, suppose uh, fire and DPW start a bit later, um, looking for would part of the school be able to be financed and then part of it would be debt. Now I know I can't do the tool for a half of a school, but what I could do is just for hypothetical, I say, okay, I'm gonna make DPW the debt exclusion so I could see 20 million out um, and see what's left so I can play with it that way. But I didn't know whether it is even possible to do that if we were facing the kind of decision, you know, can we do a significant share of the school from within our own resources, but not all. So that that was has been my question for a while. And then um, I think what you just showed us is if we're over, and this is also for the audience, if we're over, we've built up reserves and you've done the green, yellow, and red by, you, we can pull down on some reserves, but we can't exhaust them. Um, so that that's what that green, yellow, and red is doing. Is am I correct? Yeah. So it's it's saying if it's over ten million, um, you know, if we're ten million over what we have available for capital, you know, our, when we built the model, we thought that was too much to be pulled from reserves uh, to pull out ten million. Um, if it's over ten million, if it was somewhere between zero and ten, then and it's spread out over, uh, you know, between five to seven years, then that's something that is more at least up for discussion. So that's why we came up with that color coding. Okay. And then my last question is the way the town has been financing debt is you pay the principal off more quickly. You don't do flat payments. You do, you're paying more at the beginning. So we pay less in total in interest as I understand it. And I've got a municipal tool that can do flat. Mm -hmm. um, we pay less initially when we do that, but we're paying more toward the end this tool doesn't allow us to see that. Am I correct? Right. Now, so again, that's one of the more nuanced things. So in the, the financial option we presented last week, uh, it does that sort of level debt 
uh, which I think is what you're talking about, where you yep. have approximately the same debt payment, um, combined interest and principal throughout the life of it. That's actually how the library is modeled in that um, in that option. And as we get closer to these other building projects, we'll get more into those the real nitty gritty of how they would be financed for. So we haven't done a building project in a while. So most of our smaller things are, as you say, we you know we pay more upfront and it declines over the life of the debt. Um, and the reason for that is you pay that's how you pay the least amount of interest if you right. if you maximize the principal you're paying. Um, however, for building projects, you often look at several different ways of financing the debt to see what works for your community. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not saying that one is better or worse than the other. And certainly when interest rates were higher, paying it off faster made total sense. When they're this low, you're, someone is giving you money at a very low premium. So the interest costs, yes, they will be, it will be more over the lifetime, but it's no longer that huge multiple when we were right. paying at five, 10 or you know five or 10. So that is another way I think that those bars don't, um, you can smooth it out a little bit better um, over you, time. You could, you could definitely bring down the payments in the early years, potentially. Um, and again, it would raise payments in the out years, uh, but you could reduce the payments in the early years. And that's one of the things we've been thinking about uh, with the schools in particular in the debt exclusion, you know, should it be an equal payment for 30 years? Is it, you know, just philosophically, should people 30, 25 years from now be paying the same amount for the school sure. as they're paying now? Cause the school will be 25 years old at that point, but that's, but you're right. You can do it both ways to see what works. Yeah, no, I, and, I, and I said not one better, but I, I'm partly looking at ways of smoothing it out. So right now we can't do that with a model, but you can do it. Right. Yeah. Well, and I work with our financial advisor to, to do it. Yeah. Our financial advisor puts the debt schedules together. Right. Okay. I, th I think that's it. So is this tool now up in a way that people can, I guess the other question is, is it easy to find? Because when I first went to find it, it wasn't up. And then I think it is there now. And I just, the request yeah. would make it as easy as possible to find. But yeah. So we have um, a couple people that joined. I'll just show this one more time. Uh, hold on, I'm going to share my screen. You can, you can undo me and you can have me leave the room <laughs> if you want to. I'm done. All right, let's see. I think this is it. Um, all right, so if you hopefully you're seeing my screen. So this is the new um, Engage Amherst site. So to get here, you just go to engageamherst.org. And then when you'll come to the landing page and you'll scroll down to see the different activities that uh, we're currently using the, the new page for. And one of them is called Financing the Future. And that's the one focused on the four building projects. And if you go to that page, you'll come here. And so the tool, the, probably the, this is probably the easiest way to get to it is under this link section, um, the building project public engagement tool. If you click that, it'll pull it up. Okay. You know, it just, we might want to feature this whole, what you've enhanced somewhere on the homepage at least initially. And the other is, I'm not sure people saw that you were doing these forums. Sean, you had told us you were doing, so I was looking for them. So um, I didn't find it right away on the pull down calendar. I found it by going to this. So you might just for the next one, um, so I can direct people where to find it. Yeah, um, absolutely. So this first one, it was sort of a, we were finalizing some of the information. So the sort of the push out of information happened a little later than it might normally, but um, Brianna's working on making sure the next one is um, well in advance, which okay. again, for people here, it's gonna be on March uh, March 6th. Um, but you're right, this one was a little bit under the radar, but I'm happy that we have eight yeah. people that came, that's great. Okay, so you can, you can have me leave the room. Thank you very okay. much. Yep. How do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go to um, so Kathy if I remove you I'm not sure what happens here you might get kicked out that's all right with me okay <laughs> are there any other oh, okay Arthur hi Arthur You can unmute and ask your question. All right, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, great. 
so look, I, I, I would love to get behind all the projects, uh, but I'm having a hard time convincing myself that the $90.8 million cap is credible and that the assurances that the projects are gonna remain within the cap, even with the 10% contingency that's supposed to built in, be built in, that that's credible as well. And, and so, you know, I see lots of instances where the numbers just don't add up for me. So let me give you one example. Mm -hmm. um, given that construction costs escalate by about 4% a year and the $35.8 million estimate for the library was based on construction beginning two years ago and figuring that construction is not likely to start until next year, where are the cuts going to come from in the library proposal to keep that budget within the $35.8 million cap? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I don't know if that one was specifically addressed at the library presentation, but there are, and, and maybe I'll bring Lynn in for this one, there are a couple um, forums focused on the library coming up soon. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be a great time to relay that question to the, to the library also when they have their designers and their OPMs there, um, cause that's really more of a question for them. But um, Lynn, if you do wanna speak any more to that, just raise your hand and I'll bring you in. Do you have any other questions, Arthur? No, I mean, it seems to me that that's gotta come off the 35.8 million, 10% contingency has to come off. And then there are other questionable numbers in their proposal, you know, based on the 80 page report. And so, you know, I think, I think if, if you guys would like us to get behind you in this, you know, there has to be some clear indication of how the project can be built inside that cap, because it certainly doesn't look that way now. No, I think that's a, it's a great question. And Again, I strongly urge you, if you haven't already, um, to submit that question uh, probably to Lynn and, and we'll make sure that gets addressed at the forum because I think that I've heard that question a couple times. And so I think it, it would be really important that it gets addressed. Okay, thank you. Yep, I'm gonna bring Lynn in because she has raised her hand. Go ahead, Lynn. Hi, first of all, it's, I'm really glad to know so many people did find the meeting information. And let me just mention that there are the two library forums coming up. One is on the 6th, I mean the 3rd, March 3rd at 6 o'clock. And um, the other is on March 6th at 2 o'clock. And I believe, Sean, you're doing yours at noon is right is that right? Uh, i think we're doing ours in the morning so um, okay maybe okay. nine, nine o'clock i think nine or eleven o'clock so, really early so people can just do capital projects all day long if on they, sixth um uh, but let me just mention um if you've not ever overseen a project um and i have overseen a couple um what you have is an owner's project manager and that basically is the person that needs to stay within the budget. And the budget is, there is a contingency, but more importantly, every step of the way, you're making choices. Those choices, and this is a, this is a trivial one, okay? Am I gonna use this plate for the lighting fixtures or am I gonna use this plate? And the difference between that may be $100 versus $300. And so you make compromises, hopefully in the places that don't compromise, one, the quality of the structure, and the second is the sustainability of the structure. So it's when, it, again, when you're building something, it's not what the budget you see today is not the budget that you would end up with because there have to be changes along the way. Uh, I can give you an example of a big remodel I did on a space in Springfield for the university. You know, and the project manager said, oh, and you know, I think we should do the bathroom. And I just looked at it and said, we're not doing the bathroom. Those bathrooms were done five years ago. And so it's a, a situation where you need to have somebody that you have full faith in who is going to keep the money under control. 
That's my comment. And Sean, you were right before. You can go out for a partial amount in a debt exclusion or not. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, very helpful. Yeah. All right, so I think you raised your hand a second time. Actually, I didn't, but- it's, Oh, sorry, it's, your hand's still up. No, but it's not. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I, I, I was taking notes. Um, it, 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 as long as you've got me, just a question back to Lynn. Um, yeah, I, I understand that bit about the responsibilities of the project manager, but if the initial budget starts over budget, isn't that a problem? If, you're, if you've got a cap and you're already over the cap when you start with that initial budget, shouldn't we at least start with a budget that's under the cap? And now I'll put my hand down. Lynn, you're, you're back in. So our, yes, you have to start with a budget that's on, um, on target. So um, as they are doing various schematic designs, they're not at their last one. And when by the time they go out to actually bid the building of the project, they have to be on target or left less. And they have to have um, either a 10 and sometimes 15% contingency 10 is the building contingency 15 is the other last night or monday night they told us they had a five and a five you know that's okay but you're at you by the time you go out to bid the project the bid has to be within the budget there's no wiggle room here it's and this issue that what if they have all these overruns well if you have people standing there saying, you know, I don't really like it that way. I think that wall should be there. Then you have cost overruns, but you're not gonna have that if you have a, the right project uh, owner's project manager. And this is critical because the schools are getting ready to go out to bid for their owner's project manager. Now, I had never met the owner's project manager until the other night. I was pretty impressed with him. He spoke the language that I'm used to hearing when you're talking to people about owners, about costs and what you have to do. Yeah, and I'll just echo what you said, Lynn. I think even with the prior school project, um, there's always sort of value engineering that you might have to do if bids come in higher. And I think that's not an uncommon thing for designers and for owner pro owners, project managers to know that it, you know, if towns have a number and then the bids come in higher, um, you're gonna have to do some work to get it down to the number that the town can afford. Um, and so I think that's, you know, the plan we have going forward. All right, are there any other questions um, that anybody has? Irene? Hi, my name is Irene Duchovny. I, I'm still grappling with the idea of um, the library and the cost. Um, I don't still understand how they're asking the town to pay the amount of money they're asking to pay for a new building when the building is not owned by the town, right? We always hear um, that the Jones Library doesn't want to commit to things on the North Summers Library because it, the building is not owned by the Jones. But at the same time, the Jones, the Jones Library trustees wants the town to commit to things for a building is, that is not owned by the town. So um, I have a hard time justifying the funding and the cost that they're asking. Um, the, the library cost is about this cost that uh, 315 um school would cost so if you look at the fort river feasibility studies for the smallest um the smallest um school one of the estimates was around 40 million dollars so um i think we have to put in perspective the cost of the renovating the whole edition on the library 
is the same as building a new 315 million, uh, 315 people, uh, students uh, school, right? So I, I, I think I agree with Tony. I think if the priorities are the schools, let's do the schools first, then the library, because justifying, I think there is, a, sometimes I think there's a moral question here asking uh, when the trustees have certain certain way of addressing the North Armas Library versus the Jones Library and the Jones Library is not owned by the town. So there I cannot see how we can, you can, the town can justify asking that big ask when it's the cost of building um, a small school. Thank you, Irene. No, that's that's helpful feedback. And um, again, I'm I'm sure at the forum there will be a lot of topics discussed, and we can we can discuss some of these things more. And just to reiterate, I think Lynn, just to confirm, you said the, the first forum is on March third, correct? Correct. Okay. Six o'clock at March 3rd. six o'clock. Any other questions tonight? Again, I strongly encourage um, if other things pop up, you can come back on March 6th and we can talk more. Um, and also to use the um, Q&A feature on the project page, because um, a lot of the questions you may have might be good questions for the whole town to hear the answer to. Uh, Tony, bringing you back in, Tony. Thanks, Sean. Um, I just had one last request. The estimate uh, for the repair, the cash flow that was presented on Monday, it yeah. seems like it was on the more expensive option that takes longer. Is it possible for you to do a cash flow for the 14.4 um, million repair and use the same assumptions that you use for the expansion with interest rates and timing and um, the principal premium? It seemed like you were estimating with the expansion you could get 15.7 million for a cost of 15 million, which I don't quite understand. That's beyond my capacity <laughs> for numbers. But um, if you could apply the same assumption on principle to the cheaper repair. Yeah, please. so so absolutely. We'll get the, um, I can get the financing schedule for the repair option to that Kuhn Riddle uh, presented and um, and have that available. The just to clarify a couple of other things. So we, you know, the reason why I originally went with repair option one was because it seemed to me if we were going to go with a repair option as opposed to the MBLC option, typically we repair buildings over a longer period of time. Um, we don't do it all at once in one swoop in general, not that that's never done. Um, so that's why repair option one sort of to me seemed like a more if we, again, if we were looking at how do we space this out and start making repairs to this building, it seems like repair option one was more along that line. Um, but I do, but I, I get to your point, you know, when you do repair option one, if you follow the timeline that Kuhn Riddle uh, put out there, you're not borrowing the biggest portion of that until 2027. And that has a higher interest rate assumption because it's five years out in the future. So, it, so that project, that option is more expensive in general, but when you add the higher interest rate, then it's even more expensive. Um, so we can definitely model repair option two as well. That's no problem. Um, the assumptions for that one should be pretty similar to the uh, repair or the MBLC project. Again, the financial advisor, as we go out on time, he includes more of a buffer in what the interest rates might be. So I think in 2023, 2024, we're in that two to 3% range. And as you get beyond that, we start going higher. Um, but I can work with him and make sure that the the assumptions make sense based on the time time frame that we're looking at. And for repair option two, I think that borrowing would be in FY23, FY24. So it should be pretty consistent interest rate assumption for that one. Thank you. Yep. All right, any final questions? Um, again, want to thank everybody for um, coming tonight and asking what you did. And I, again, I strongly encourage you all to use the Q&A. Some of these questions that you've asked tonight, I might um, just enter them on the Q&A myself because some of them are good ones for just everyone to be able to see the answer to. Um, so I might, you might see those get put out there um, to help the town. Give people one more minute, see if any questions pop up. 
Uh, Arthur Keen asked how many people ended up attending. So we had eight people, um, include, uh, two of which were counselors and the rest were uh, residents, I believe. All right, one last call for questions. And if not, I will say good night and thank you all again. All right, well, thank you one last time. Um, if you have any questions, you can either email me, you can use the, the Q&A function. Um, if you can get onto that engageamherst.org website and, and play around with it and see what it has to offer, um, subscribe to this if you're interested and you wanna get updates going forward. Uh, but thank you again, have a good night.